today will be the last day that I start on this side, hopefully. It was occurring to me that being right-handed, you'd be able to see what I wrote better if I started on the right side of the board and moved this way. Then I would never cover up things with my body. Huh? Isn't that clever? OK, but today I'll start here, because I already did. Uh, so today I just want to uh, first start off by uh, clarifying substitution in definite integrals. So this is coming from, uh, well, one of the problems on the exam had you use substitution on a definite integral. And uh, one person uh, that's not indefinite, but indefinite, uh, one person made the mistake of doing the substitution but not changing the limits of integration. And so I just want to clarify that point uh, since we haven't talked about that formally. Um, and then the second thing I want to talk about is the average value of a function. And time permitting, uh, we will get to well, a related topic, which is the mean value theorem. Of course, this was a, a statement about derivatives, right? That's what we saw last term. But there's actually a mean value theorem for integrals. Okay. So that's our ambitious goal. And this is basically cleaning up a, a few nice topics before we move on to the question of volumes of solids, which everybody I know is really looking forward to. All right, so let's just start by clarifying substitution uh, in the case of definite integrals. So let me just give you the example from the, the midterm. Start, uh, we integrated from 2 to 5, uh, 1 over x minus 1 dx. And as I think everybody in here uh, deduced, the correct way to evaluate the definite integral, right, if you forgot about the uh, I mean, the indefinite integral, if you forgot about the limits, is you can use u substitution, for instance. Okay. So if we do u substitution, we let u equal x minus 1, and then du is just dx. No? And so, <coughs> well, there's two ways to approach this sort of definite integral where you're going to have to use substitution. The way that... Uh, I think I, I did in class before, is I said, OK, forget the limits of integration. Evaluate the indefinite integral. Right? Get your solution. And then put all the x's back in at the end, after you've done your substitutions. Okay? And then evaluate the 2 and the 5. But there is a more direct route, which is instead of having to plug all your x's back in at the end, you can just change the limits of integration right? based on how you've changed your x into a u. So when I rewrite this, let me not change those at first, but let me add a little descriptive term. Right? Instead of saying 2 to 5, let me write I'm going from x equals 2 to x equals 5. Because that's, of course, where those 2 and 5 are coming from. Now the dx turned into a du, and the x minus 1 turned into a u. And now I want to change these limits in, into what the u's, the corresponding u's should be. Okay, so if x is 2, what would the u be? Well, when x is 2, u is 2 minus 1 is 1. So this is u equals 1. And when x is 5, u is 5 minus 1 is 4. And now, when I evaluate this integral, I won't have to put x's back in at the end. I can make this ln. Oh, I think on the exam, actually, this was squared on the bottom. But, uh, well, OK. OK, we'll make it uh, minus u to the minus 1 
And then now we don't have to evaluate at 2 and 5. We don't have to plug any of the x's back in. We can just evaluate at the new limits, 1 and 4. And so this becomes, uh, let's see, minus a fourth, minus, minus, I don't mean a parenthesis, minus, minus 1, so plus 1, which is 3 fourths, which is what you got on the exam. Pregunta. Yes. What? Oh, we'll talk about the specifics on the exam later. Just uh, to, we'll we'll discuss this later. If u equals x squared minus one. Oh, okay, sure. Ah, good question. Good question. Okay, so uh, you uh, there you need to rely a little bit on uh, sometimes on on you know the situation more. You need more context, right? Uh, so, for instance, uh, well, let's do another example and, and try to answer exactly your question, okay? And do, do, does everybody understand the question that Kaiwei is getting at? Okay, so what Kaiwei is wondering is, let's say you did a substitution and uh, it ended up being something like u squared equals x minus 1, right? So that when you plugged in whatever your x value was, you ended up with something like u squared equals 1. Right? So now should u be plus or minus 1? Right? Because both, I mean, both of those work, right? 1 squared is 1, minus 1 squared is 1. Right? So in that sort of case, we're going to need a little more information. We're going to need more context. Okay, so let's do another example. All right. Uh, well, this is something that you know the answer to, but now we, uh, we prove it. Okay, so this is supposed to be a circle with radius r. Okay, and I want to know what's the area of this circle. Of course, what's the answer? Pi r squared, right? We know that, duh. Okay, why? Why is it pi r squared? That's the formula. Where did you learn this formula? Oh my goodness. Geometry class, maybe it was probably earlier than, I mean, it must have been elementary school or so. I mean, it was a long, long time ago, yeah, that you, you learned this. Okay, but they just told it to you. Okay, so let's, let's prove it. Okay, well, let's be clever. Let's be clever. So first, uh, if I wanted to find the area of something, what sort of tool would I be using? What's that? A piece of string to find the area? This is tricky. This is tricky. I mean, you, that's, I'm not, how do you use the, the piece of string? How are you going to use it to find the area? I mean, I can see the perimeter, for instance, like the circumference. But the actual area, <coughs> I mean, I guess you could try to, Lay down a lot of string. And could work, but, uh, but in, this, in the context of this class, what, what tool do we have that helps you find area? Integrals, yeah, OK. Um, problem is, if you want to integrate something, you need a function. And well, the circle doesn't actually isn't described by a function. Right? Because, well, if it was a function, right, it would fail the, the vertical line test, right? So there's no, there can't be. Uh, but of course, there's an easy way around that. Namely, well, we don't have to compute the area of the whole circle. There's a lot of symmetry in a circle. What if we just computed the area of the top half? Yeah, then just multiply it by 2, and you get the area of the whole circle. OK, and, and we actually know a formula for the, area, uh, for the uh, top half of the circle. All right, so what's the top half of the circle? 
top half of a circle centered at zero with radius r, is given by y equals, how many remember? The formula for the upper half of a circle with radius r centered at 0, 0. Well, okay, let's ask, what's the, what's the equation of a circle? Centered at zero. Not quite r, but actually r squared equals uh -huh, x squared plus y squared. Right? And of course, if you shifted the circle around, then you'd have these x minus h's and y minus k's beneath the square, right? That's how you can find the center. Okay, so if I wanted to solve for y, I would subtract x squared, right? And I would get y squared equals r squared minus x squared. Right? And then, of course, to get rid of the square, I have to take the square root. Okay, but there's actually two. There's plus or minus square roots. They're two different solutions. All right? But since I want the top half, then I take the positive square root. But I could do the same thing if I wanted the bottom half. I'd just take the negative square root. Okay, so we have a nice function. And so if I wanted to find the area, I could just integrate from, well, what is this? If it has radius r, this is minus r to r. Right? Just integrate this function from minus r to r. Of course, you notice this. It's actually going to be the same area on both sides. So maybe I should just integrate from 0 to r and then multiply by 4, right? Because that's 1 fourth of the circle. Okay, so let's do that. So the area of the circle is, well, it's 4, right? Because that's how many quadrants there are, times. The integral from 0 to r of the square root of r squared minus x squared dx. <coughs> nice. So all we have to do is actually evaluate that integral. What do you think? What do we do? Well, okay, the 4, that's pretty easy. I know what to do with that. We don't have to worry about the 0 and the r till the end. But we do have this funny r squared minus x squared under a radical. Okay, Jenna suggested trig substitution. Give it a shot. So let's rewrite this. And <coughs> So what is the trig substitution? I'll give you, I'll spot you the x equals. R sine theta, right? When the, uh, the x squared comes second, okay, after the minus, then you're in the sine case. So R sine of theta. And of course, then dx is R cosine of theta d theta. And the square root of r squared minus x squared become r cosine theta. From the well, we wrote down that formula, or you can just compute it directly, right? And look at r squared minus r squared sine squared theta, factor out the r squared, then you have one minus sine squared, which equals cosine squared. So you have r squared cosine squared. Take the square root and you get r cosine theta. Blah 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 blah. blah. No? <laughs> okay, or you just look it up in your Notes. Your choice. Okay, so this is a nice substitution. Now, 
let's add in here that we weren't just looking at 0 to r. It was really x equals 0 to x equals r. Okay, and let's see what happens. Well, the square root of r squared minus x squared, that became r cosine of theta. And then dx became, oh, well, r cosine of theta d theta. So I just have to square these things and add the d theta. So this bit was r cosine, I'm sorry, this bit was r cosine theta. And the dx is r cosine theta d theta. So you have r squared, cosine squared, d theta. Yeah, yeah see, I have to move back this way every time I want to leave room for you to see what I did. Yeah, I think it's right. I should walk this way. OK. All right, well, uh, this r squared is a constant. So that I can, I can pull out. I don't have to worry about that till the end. <coughs> OK. But now I want to switch from thetas to r to, from x's to thetas everywhere. Yeah. So I still have these x's sitting around. So I need to figure out when x is 0 or x is r, what my theta is going to be. Oh, yeah, of course, yeah, you can, you can, you can use this formula, right, x over r equals sine theta, and then take the, the arc sine. Um, let's just go back to the picture right, and try to figure this out, OK? Because we, we have some more context. So for instance, uh, when we're going from 0 to r, and that means we're going from 0 to r. No? OK. Uh, so what is happening to theta in that time as far as right, the curve? Well, what's it doing? It's going from this point, and then the, the angle is Going up to here, right? So what is actually happening to the to the angle? Well, the angle here starts at zero, and what does it go up to? Pi over pi over two. Okay. Now, I said that this was actually a response to Kaiwei's question, so. Let me explain a little bit more. If you were just looking, for instance, for an angle that was, uh, well, such that the sine was 0, right? So when x is 0, right, okay, 0 equals r sine of theta. Forget about the r, you can just divide by it. If you're looking for an angle where the sine is theta, well, there's actually, right, 0 works, but also pi works. And 2 pi and 3 pi and 4 pi, but let's just concentrate on 0 and pi. So how do you know which is the right one in this case? Well, we have a picture, <laughs> right? There's context. We know what we're trying to compute. We're trying to compute the area under the circle in the first quadrant. Right? So that's how we know we're actually going to go from 0 to pi over 2. And the same thing from the other side. If I wanted, uh, if I wanted to know which one was going to be giving me uh, the, the pi over 2 or, or something, you know, I, this angle, pi over 2, is not the only one that's going to give me the same sine, right? You've, uh, or the same cosine if that was a problem. Okay, so you just have to use more information sometimes to answer that question. Okay? Uh, yeah, maybe I'll write up a, a few problems for you that, where you have to make this choice. Uh, and then we get a little more practice with that. Okay, well, in any case, in this case, uh, we're going to be going from 0 to pi over 2, right? So now here's where I should say theta equals 0, theta equals pi over 2. Right. So now we just need to integrate cosine squared. Okay, so 
how do we do that? You guys remember the trick? Mm -hmm. You can use the I trick with integration by parts. Right. So let's, uh, let's do that on the side. We'll, we'll track this over here. When we figure out what it is, we'll, we'll put it in there. Let's just quickly do it. So the trick is to first break up the two cosines. Okay, and we're going to do integration by parts. And we'll use a tabular method here. Okay, so if you differentiate, you get minus sine. And if you integrate, you get sine. And now we shove the sign on the left over to the right. And then we play Dina's trick. And we rewrite this as 1 minus cosine squared. Now when we differentiate the minus 1, it goes to 0. And when we differentiate 1 minus cosine squared, well, the, you can, I mean, when you integrate it, the 1, of course, just becomes theta. And, well, you get minus, now the integral of cosine squared, which is what you wanted in the beginning. All right? So that's your i. So we just get theta minus i. So we draw in our lines, plus minus. So let's see what we're going to get here. We get r squared. <coughs> now the integral of cosine squared is going to be cosine times sine. Okay. Then we have minus minus, which is going to be plus, theta minus i. All right. So we get a plus theta. Now what's going to happen to that that minus i? Well, you take that minus i, you add it to the other side, you get 2i, you divide by 2, right? and you get, you're going to end up with a 1 half in the front. Right? So we just make this r squared over 2. And then we have to evaluate at 0 and pi over 2. Let me write this again over here. So here, if i was our integral of cosine squared, then i was equal to cosine of theta, sine of theta, plus theta minus i. Then you add the i to both sides. And then you divide by 2. And I leave out the plus c since I know I'm gonna, I have a definite integral. Okay, so that's what I've done here. I just divided by two. Okay, and now I just need to plug things in, and this is really nice because, well, when I plug in pi over two into say a cosine, what do I get? What's the, yeah, the cosine right up here. That's the x coordinate. The x coordinate is zero. So that, that whole term is going to go away. And what about when I plug in 0? The sine is going to go to, uh, to 0. So somehow this was not going to matter whatsoever. It's kind of cool. So let's see. So you have r squared over 2 times. Well, when you plug in pi over 2, that's 0 and that's pi over 2. Then you have to subtract what happens when you plug in 0. But of course, that goes away because of the sine of 0. And then that's 0. So there's just nothing to happen there. Okay, and so you get pi r squared over 4. You think, oh, wait a second, we shouldn't it just be pi r squared. But then you remember, oh, wait, right? This is without the 4 in the front. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if we multiply by 4, boom, we get it. So this, this becomes 4 pi r squared over 4, which is pi. So calculus actually accomplishes what all of your teachers just told you was true.
Now, historically, um, boy, I guess as early as maybe Archimedes, way, way, way back, uh, he came up with formulas like this using an approach that was very similar to the integral. Right? So, uh, and he basically knew, I mean, of course, he didn't have a whole notion of limits, and he certainly didn't use the notation, but he would not have been surprised uh, if he'd have been born, you know, a couple thousand years later to see what we were doing. Uh, so, historically, actually, integration is much, much older than differentiation. Much, much older. All right, so you can use the same sort of, uh, <coughs> same idea, for instance, if you wanted to compute the area of an ellipse. You just need to know a nice formula for an ellipse. And of course, you do have such a one if you've studied conics before. You know that uh, an ellipse comes from, you have a formula that looks something like this. So you can, you can use this in the same way that you used the uh, formula for a circle to, well, you just choose one portion of the ellipse, right, where, the, where you can solve for y, for instance. Right? And then you'll have to make a very similar trig substitution, and you'll be able to get a formula for an ellipse. And if you actually look back at any of the areas that you know, and of course you don't know that many, but if you know them, you can... Other than, of course, a rectangle, which we assume we, we know how to do, <coughs> you can get them all with integrals in a reasonably straightforward way. Questions? Yeah. See, now you know why an area, the area of a circle is pi r squared. <laughs> well, why up to knowing what an integral is. All right, so I now want to talk to you about the average value of a function. So we've, we've looked at a few little topics like this before. Uh, for instance, we looked at arc length uh, a couple weeks ago. Little things like this. So this is another one of these nice little applications of calculus that I just want you to be exposed to. And it's just another example of how the, the philosophy of calculus makes it very easy to solve uh, certain problems. So let's say <coughs> all right, we have a nice function, f of x. And we restrict our attention to some interval, a to b. I'm, I'm interested in this part of the graph. And the question is, what is the average value of the function on that interval? Now, if this was a discrete function, okay, so discrete meaning, right, you just give you, you know, some finite number of, uh, of points. Okay, and I just told you, okay, at, at, at 1, here's f of x. At 2, here's f of x. Here's you know, f of 3, f of 4, f of 5, and so forth. How would you find the average value? For instance, let's say I asked you what was the average temperature in February. Take, take what? Okay, so take, take say, the temperature on... February 1st, the temperature on February 2nd, February 3rd, and so forth, and then add them up. Divide by uh, how many days are there in February? 28, right? Okay. Now, is that really the average temperature? Why not? Well, when I tell you the, what's the temperature on February 1st, is this a well-defined question? I didn't tell you. I asked you. you know, 
what do you, when do you mean? Where do you mean? Right? Okay. So of course. So okay. Well, let's handle the where do you mean by saying uh, we mean you know whatever uh, you know on the, the Bank of America uh, you know, clock, right? Wherever they give you the temperature. Okay. We'll say right there what was the temperature every day. But of course, it's still a problem of that changes throughout the day. Right? So if you really wanted a better gauge of, say, what the average temperature was on February 1st even, you'd have to take more data points. Right? And of course, if you really wanted the actual average temperature, how many data points would you have to take? Yeah, you'd take one for every moment in time. Right? You'd need it to be continuous. Okay? Of course, passing from a finite number of points to an infinite number of points well, that's just what calculus is all about, right? That's this whole limiting procedure. So let's, let's just take a, a quick chance to, to see what it would mean in a finite case, right? If we took a few points, okay, so this say is x1 corresponds to x2, x3, x4, x5, and x6. Okay. And then we, I guess we can call a, that'll be our x0, and b will be our x7. So if I wanted to get a first estimate of the average value of the function, I could do, well, let's see. Um, maybe I'll make sure that the distances between these are all the same. Right. These are all going to be just the same distance, and let's just call it delta x. Okay, just some. We'll measure it, right? For instance, if this represents uh, a week of time, right? This could be, you know, you measure once every day at right at midnight or something. Right. Well, actually, there's eight here. It'll be an eight-day week. <laughs> okay. Uh, so what would this give us? Well, at this point, for instance, at uh, well here at, at x zero you get f of x0. And at this point, you get f of x1. And so what you guys said we should do is we should take the value of, at each of these points, add them up, and then divide by the number of values you took. So you could do f of x0 plus f of x1 plus f of x2 plus okay, f of x7 and then we're going to divide by 7. Right? Okay, and that would give us a first approximation. I guess, actually, there's, a, there's eight of these, aren't they? Aren't there? <laughs> okay. Um, now, the number of points that I choose, okay, so if, let's say uh, there, there's my, my 7, now that can become n, for instance. Uh, or maybe if, maybe this numbering process is making things nasty, so we'll make that a 1 and 2 and, and so forth. Maybe make this a little easier to number. Okay, so. That'll be an 8. Okay. Uh, the number, say n, of points that we choose Well, it's equal, I claim, to the length of the interval of time divided by how many pieces, I mean, the length, the, the width of each of these pieces. Right. To see this, well, if you take each of these pieces, delta x, and multiply it by the number of points, then you get the total length of this, right? I think there's a small problem. Kaiway sees it. Yeah, th there's exactly right. That's actually where it, now I remember why I numbered it that way. Yeah. Okay. So why is why did we number it zero to seven in the first place? Well, let's say we just took one interval. Okay, the whole thing at once. All right. Then b minus a should equal. Well, th then the delta x is b minus a. 
and then there are, but there's actually two points, right? One, two. So if I put a two here, okay, and this is supposed to be b minus a, that would be wrong. Okay, so actually my n needs to be, that's why I should start with zero and let the last number be n. Okay, so I was actually right the first time. Okay. I knew I did everything for a reason. Okay, and you can, this is a clever way to do it over here. There we go. Okay, so now it's true what I said. So now if you went from zero to one, that would be your n. It would be one, so it would be okay. Okay, so the length of the interval b minus a equals, right, the total number of gaps times, I mean, the, the yeah, total number of gaps times the length of each gap. Right? b minus a equals n times delta x. So delta x is one of these gaps, and n is how many gaps you have. And of course, b minus a is just the sum of each of these gaps. Okay, so n is b minus a over delta x. So let me write, uh, in, in statistics they use a bar when they're going to do the average of something. So let me write f bar for the average of the function. Right. So this should, well, at least it should approximately be equal to, right. well, let's see, you should have f of x 0 plus right, everything in between up to f <coughs> of xn. And then you should divide by n, okay, the number of these points. But we know that this denominator, this n, can be written as b minus a divided by delta x. Okay, so let's fiddle with this thing a little bit. Let's see, so I take this and I divide it by b minus a over delta x, which is the same thing as multiplying it by delta x over b minus a. So this becomes f of x 0 times delta x plus f of xn times delta x divided by b minus a. <coughs> Toss this delta x up top. Okay, now why am I doing that? Why am I doing any of this? Well, remember when we want to set up a definite integral? Of course, you have to have this limit in there, and we'll get to that in a second. And then you're supposed to have a big sum, and then you're supposed to have a function. And then you're supposed to multiply that function by some delta x. And I now am in a position where I have a function multiplied by a delta x. Okay, and I can rewrite this as a sum. So this is equal to the sum from i equals 0 to n of f of x i times delta x divided by b minus a. So we already agreed that if I wanted to find the actual average value, I would need to take the limit as the number of these points goes to infinity. Right? You need to check as, as you know, infinitely often. So this f bar should equal the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum from i equals 0 to n, f of xi times delta x over b minus a. <coughs> okay, now let's assume for a moment that this limit exists. If the limit doesn't exist, then, then we're, we're hosed anyway. 
But if the limit does exist, then I can take this b minus a, which is just a constant, and I can pull it outside the limit. So this is equal to 1 over b minus a times the limit as n goes to infinity, sum i equals 0 to n, f of x i times delta x. And that limit should look very familiar. What is that limit? Hmm. That's the integral, right? This limit is the integral from a to b of f of x dx, okay? By definition, right? That's how we define that integral, was that limit. And so we're able to get this formula. The average value of a function on the interval a, b is this. Assuming that, right, we made this assumption that this limit existed. Right? So that means the integral has to exist. <coughs> right? And so, for instance, if the function is continuous, we know that the function then is Riemann integrable. Right? And this will give you the, absolute, the average value. Right? If you had a function which wasn't continuous, of course, not, lots of nasty things could start to happen. So this is just another, uh, another example of the way you think in calculus it gives you a very simple expression for something. So this is actually really neat. The average value is well, you just compute the area and then you divide by the length. You take the whole area under the curve and then you divide by the length of the interval. And that tells you it, what the average value is at each point, which actually I think is intuitively not that, that hard to see. Right? If you took the average value of f and multiplied it by the length of the interval, right? if you took the average value of f and multiplied it by the length, shouldn't that give you exactly equal to the area under the curve? But of course, if you did the average value times the interval, that's a rectangle. So it's telling you that somehow you should be able to approximate the area under this curve by just one rectangle. In fact, you're not approximating, you're giving the exact thing. Okay. We'll make that actually more precise when we do the mean value theorem for integral. Okay, well, let's do a quick example of using the formula, but I mean, it's, it's not that complicated, I guess. <laughs> All right, well, let's take the function 1 plus x squared on the interval minus 1 to 2. And let's find the average value of that function. So, okay, this is not so, so complicated, right? We just use the formula. So in this case, your a is minus 1, your b is 2. So the f bar, and mind you, this notation, I'm hiding in here the fact that we're looking at the average value on the interval. Right? It's not just the average value of the whole function everywhere, just on the interval. But I, I won't write that when there's no confusion. So it should be 1 over 2 minus minus 1. Okay, that should be minus a. And then we're supposed to integrate from minus 1 to 2, 1 plus x squared. Okay, and now this is this is just brute force computation, right? This is we know how to do this. Okay, let's see. So of course, one over three is what you get out front. Um, the integral of one plus x squared. What's the integral of one plus x squared? X plus one third x cubed. Excellent. And then we have to evaluate at minus one and two. Okay, so let's see. Uh, when you plug in a 2, you get a 2. Yeah, a 2, you get uh, 2 plus 8 thirds. And then you have to subtract. Let's see, when you put in a minus 1, you get minus 1 uh, minus a third. 
And let's see here. So you get a third times, okay, you get two minus minus one is plus one is three. Then you have eight thirds minus minus a third is eight thirds plus a third, which is nine thirds, which is three. So three plus three over three is two. Oh, look at that. That's a nice number. <laughs> Okay, so this is very straightforward, right? Just a nice formula at this point. <coughs> All right, let's see what time do we have. Okay, um, so. The next thing to do is the mean value theorem for integrals. To do that, let me just briefly recall the mean value theorem for derivatives. So let me, just to give these distinctive names, when I'm going to do the mean value theorem for derivatives, let me just call it MVT prime, All right, the prime to remind you it's a derivative. So, okay, the hypotheses look something like this. Uh, let f be continuous on some closed interval a, b. Uh, differentiable on the open interval a, b. Then there exists some C in the interval, which I should say open interval. Such that the derivative at C equals f of B minus f of A over B minus A. Okay, that's the formal statement. What does it mean? Well, let's draw a picture. Try to re recall what this means. So I don't need so much. Okay, so I have some nice function. There's no real problems with it, so it's continuous, differentiable wherever I need it to be. And let me pick a point A and a point B. All right. So let's read the conclusion of the mean value theorem. Because right? we, okay, we assume all these are already taken care of. And let's start on the right side. We see f of b minus f of a over b minus a. What is that actually giving us? Well, b minus a, that's somehow this distance. Okay, it's how far you've run from a to b. And what's f of b minus f of a? Yeah, it's how much you changed, right? Your f of b minus f of a, this is up here, right? There's your a f of a, and here's your b, f of b, it's, it's how much you rose, right? So this is actually giving you the rise over the run. Right? It's actually giving you the slope of the line, right, which goes, ugh, that is so difficult. Okay, if you draw the, the line that, well, it's supposed to be going through there. Right? If you draw the secant line, right, the line that hits at this point and this point, this number is just giving you the slope. Right? <coughs> if this was a position curve, then this line here, the slope of this line that is, would be telling you the average velocity between those two points. 
right? Because, well, position, right, is a function of time. This is how long it took you, and this is how far you went. So that's your average velocity, right? How far you went divided by how long it took you. Okay, fine. And what did the left side say? Well, the left side says the derivative at some point c. Well, the derivative is giving you the slope of a tangent line, right, at one point. So in this case, it's a point c. And it's supposed to be equal, which means that there's some tangent line whose slope is equal to the slope of the secant line. Moreover, the point c is coming somewhere between a and b. So there's some point in here, say like right there, where when you draw the tangent line to the curve, right, it's parallel to the secant line. Okay, they have the same slope. Okay, that's what the mean value theorem is telling you. Okay, it's telling you that if your average velocity is this, then there was some point where your instantaneous velocity was the same as your average velocity over the whole interval. In last term, we remember we did this example with the uh, the police sitting in, in on the, the the tunnel, right, going out of Boston. Right, they they don't need to know uh, that you were speeding at any given time. Right, they don't. I mean, they don't actually have to to figure out what time you were speeding. All they do is they look what time you went into the tunnel, what time you went out of the tunnel. From that, they can get your average velocity going through the tunnel. And if that average velocity is greater than the speed limit then you must have sped at some point. Because by the mean value theorem, your instantaneous velocity at one point was your average velocity. So if the speed limit going through the tunnel is, I don't know what it is, 45 or something? Whatever it is, it was 45, and it, you went out, and that time would work out to an average of 55 miles an hour, they know at some point you were going 55 miles an hour, and then thus breaking the speed limit, and thus they can give you a ticket without having actually observed you breaking the law. So you see, this is how calculus, you know, works for the man. OK. So that's all, all the mean value theorem is saying that, right? There, there is a point where the instantaneous velocity equals the average velocity. Right? <coughs> well, let's see if we can't translate that somehow into integrals. And here's the way we're, go we're going to do it. We're going to apply the mean value theorem for derivatives to the fundamental theorem of calculus, or with the fundamental theorem of calculus. So you remember when we did f talk 1, we defined this function g of x. We said let g of x equal the integral from a to x of f of t dt. Right? And here, we assume, say, our function was continuous on the, on the closed interval a, b. Okay, so here we're <coughs> f is continuous on a, b. And then what did f talk 1 say? Well, it told you something about the derivative. Well, the derivative of this function g is actually your inner function f. Okay, this was, okay, that's f talk 1. Okay, so that's what we proved. Uh, in particular, something nice is that this function g prime is differentiable everywhere on the interval a, b. So what it actually turns out is you have a function, right? So now instead of having f, think of your big G, which is continuous. It's not just continuous on AB, but it's also differentiable on AB. Okay? And even on the closed interval AB. And I'll just let you know when it's differentiable on the closed interval AB, then this C can actually be taken anywhere in the closed interval AB. Okay, fine. Uh, so let's apply the mean value theorem to this G of X. So by the mean value theorem for derivatives, there exists some c in the closed interval <coughs> ab such that what? Well, 
f prime of c, so in this case, f is, is your g. So g prime of c equals, well, again, your f is g. So g of b minus g of a over b minus a. What's g prime of c? Well, g prime is f. So this g prime of c is just f of c. Right. Now let's see, what is g of b? Right, because we want to evaluate this right side. Right. Well, let me see, let me just pull this one over b minus a out. You know, g of b is just the integral from a to b of f of t dt or f of x dx, whatever you want to call it. And you remember what g of a is? Zero, right? Just go from a to a, right? So you don't compute anything. So actually that g of a is just zero. So you just get the integral from a to b. F of, and let me change it from a t to an x, just so we're happy. But what is this? That's f bar, right, on AB. That's the average value of the function. So what this says is there exists some point C in the interval such that the value of f at that point equals the average value of the function. So that means if you have some function and you look what's its average value, okay, and fine, you find the average value, there actually must have been a point where the function obtain that average value. Right? It can't you know, be lower than the average value and then be higher than the average value, but never actually hit the average value. Okay? It has to hit it somewhere. And of course, this all comes down to continuity. Okay? It's just like with the intermediate value theorem. right? You just can't have that jump right, where you would miss the average value. It has to hit that average value. Right? It can't always be above it. It can't always be below it. So if it's some point below and some point above, at some point, it has to hit that average value. Okay, that's all this is saying. So we can, we can rewrite this as a, a theorem. Okay, and I'll, I'll call it, when I call it the mean value theorem for integrals, I'll write it like this, integral MVT, as opposed to MVT prime. Okay, so we let... <coughs> F be continuous on a closed interval AB, then there exists some C in the interval such that the average value of F on AB equals F of C. And if you want <coughs> to write it explicitly, of course, oops, f bar is 1 over b minus a, integral from a to b, f of x dx. Isn't it nice and easy? It all falls out. Like it was designed that way. In math, by the way, this is how you know when you're doing something right. So if you define things in such a way that all the theorems just kind of flow right out of the definitions, you've done something right. If you have to work really hard for everything, there's probably a better definition out there. But there's more. 
there's more. This is not the end of the story. There's something else we can say from this. <coughs> okay. Let's draw a picture. Okay. Now let's, let's assume that we're dealing with only functions that are positive. So I have a nice positive function, okay, f of x. I choose a couple of points here, a and b. Now, the average value of the function, right, we know is going to be 1 over b minus a times the area under the curve. Okay. But we also know that there is some point in the interval where f actually, at that point, gives you the average value. Okay? That's what this mean value theorem for integrals says. Okay? So <coughs> let's assume we found that point. Okay? Maybe it's right there. There's your c. Okay? So we know that f of c should equal 1 over b minus a times the integral of a to b f of x dx. Now let me just move this b minus a to the other side. So I get f of c times b minus a equals the integral from a to b f of x dx. So I now know that the area under this curve, okay, which is this stuff, equals just the product of two little numbers. And one of them is just the length of this interval. And now let's see, f of c, okay, so there's your, your point. Let me drag it over here. There's your f of c. Okay. I, if I multiply this number f of c times this distance, a minus b, what that's actually telling me is the area of this rectangle. Okay, bounded by a, b, and f of c. Okay. So I have two different areas. I have the area under the curve between a and b, and then I have the area of this rectangle, right, whose base is b minus a and whose height is f of c. And what the mean value theorem for integrals is saying is that there is this point c such that the area of this rectangle is the same as the area under the curve between a and b. This is pretty cool. Right? You take this whole nasty area and you can rewrite it as the area of this rectangle with the same base as what you want. Right? And that there's a point in between A and B that does it. Okay, so this is already, this is very cool. Okay, so let's do uh, an example. Okay, so we actually already looked at uh, what? Um, 1 plus x squared on minus 1 to 2, right. and we computed that the average value, I think, was 2. Right. Now, the mean value theorem says that there's some point between minus 1 and 2 where f will evaluate to actually be the number 2. Right. It will evaluate to be the average value of the function. Right. So by the mean value theorem for integrals, there exists some c between minus 1 and 2 such that f of c is equal to 2. Okay, equals the average value. That's what it said, right? There is some point such that the function at that point equals the average value. And our average value is 2. Okay, but we can solve for this explicitly. This is easy. We know what the function is. Okay, the function is 1 plus x squared. If you put c in, you get 1 plus c squared. Okay, so c squared plus 1 equals 2. c squared equals 1. 
<coughs> and here you actually get two choices. You can let C be plus or minus one. Right? And both of them are in the interval, right? Minus one's in there, one is in there. So if we draw a quick sketch of 1 plus x squared, right? Well, let's see. So it starts at 1, right? And then a nice parabola. Okay, so we'll go to 1 and to 2. And then we have to go to minus 1. Okay, so you have the area under the curve, right, above the x-axis between minus 1 and 2. And what this is saying is if you take the point at either 1 or minus 1, and of course they give you the same height, you can draw the rectangle across, and the area of this rectangle will be the same as the area under the curve. So that's kind of cool. This area is the same as this area. Oops. Should just be under the curve. Yeah. Cool. Questions? Yeah. Mind you, uh, in this case, it was very easy to actually find this point C. The mean value theorem does not, in general, tell you how to find this point. <coughs> All right. It may not be uh, technically feasible to find the point where this works. Right. At least uh, not without, you know, you might have to approximate it. Right. There may not be an analytic method for actually finding this point C. This is one of the downsides of existence proofs. Whenever they just say there exists a point C, without telling you how to find the C, and the proof doesn't tell you how to find it, okay, that this is, it's not the best situation in the world, but it can happen, and it does. <coughs>